Houseman Rational Buyer, hosted by Charles H. Green. Um, the series is done in partnership between Trusted Advisor Associates and the Get Real Project. We've been doing this for about two years now. Um, I think this is our eighth or ninth webinar in the series. I kind of lost track. But you can go to trustedadvisor.com backslash webinars. We actually have one coming up uh, on the books in February 2020. Uh, the topic is the 2020 Trust Audit, Three Anchors for Bolstering Your Business. And, and it's also hosted by Charles H. Green, who is the CEO of Trusted Advisor Associates and author of the Trusted Advisor book. Uh, we're going to cover the trust equation, the trust creation process, and the three trust principles in that next webinar. And we'll announce more webinars in early 2020. Um, so thanks for everybody who's, who's joining. There's a chat feature. Um, as you, probably pops up in your Zoom. Feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. We'll, we'll pause for any questions that are relevant to the content and then we're gonna have a Q&A at the end. Um, and I think that's about it on my end. So I'm gonna hand it off to Charlie um, and enjoy the webinar. Thanks everybody. Okay, good morning everybody. I think it's morning for everyone unless we got some Europeans on here. <clears throat> Welcome, thanks for joining again. I think we're actually gonna have a little poll in a few minutes in asking you, how many have uh, come through previous webinars, first time, et cetera. So that's just our curiosity. Anyway, oh, there we go. Have you attended one of our programs before? Take a minute and just state our curiosity, if you would, please. We're curious about who you all are. And we'll give it, what, 30 seconds for people to punch in here. So we got about 60%. All right. Looks like we got more new people than not. All right. All right, we don't need to uh, to get 100% uh, conclusion on that one. Jason or Tracy, if you wanna pull it. And uh, we'll do that one at the end. Okay, let's get started. How to sell to an irrational buyer. Uh, I will be curious to hear motivations for people as we get going here. Um, it's, uh, uh, it, I think it's a subject that actually stretches beyond buying, but obviously it's got some compelling uh, components to it, just as stated. Quick bit about me. As Jason said, I'm co-author of The Trusted Advisor. I'm co-author with Andrea Howe, who is on the call today with us, of The Trusted Advisor Field Book, and I solo wrote one book, Trust-Based Selling. Um, founder of Trusted Advisor Associates. I had 20 years in management consulting before that. Uh, MBA 100,000 years ago, undergraduate degree in philosophy. Not a, not a remunerative undergraduate degree, I have to say. Although I did drive a taxi part-time in New York City at that point. So I have some combat experience. There's the books that I just mentioned. Um, by the way, next year, 2020, we're coming out with a 20th anniversary edition of the original trusted advisor. Simon Schuster has agreed to do that with us and we're kind of hard at work incorporating the book to, or changing the book to incorporate a little phenomenon called the internet, <clears throat> which wasn't much around back in 2000. All right, let's get into it. Uh, selling to an irrational buyer. You've probably all seen before buyers who insist <clears throat> on unreasonable time frames, maybe, uh, who won't stay on topic or maybe you've seen uh, those that get into excessive levels of detail. Buyers who don't really don't seem to understand or care about the subject matter, uh, and that leads to all kinds of dysfunctions. Buyers who kind of are looking for, you know, the, uh, the heaven and the clouds and nirvana as a result of this particular work that you're doing, which isn't quite nirvana leading. Uh, buyers who are not really, don't seem to be interested in outcomes, benefits, value, they're just sticking to the mere mechanics of the process. Buyers who may be hung up on one particular aspect of the work, and I'm sure there you all could add dozens more examples of what we might call irrational buyers. Uh, that's just kind of a, a sampling of, of some off the top of my head and experience. They all leave you befuddled. Look, what do you do in a situation where somebody on the opposite side that you're trying to collaborate with, you're trying to do right, and they're just giving you all this stuff? Uh, I tried to find the right word for how it leaves you, and I ended up with just befuddled. What do you do? Um, and by the way, <clears throat> the dynamic that I'm going to talk about, it's not just about buying. Uh, over the years, as I've looked at selling in particular, selling and buying, along with some other topics, advice giving, you know, getting your recommendations accepted, the area of change management, as well as buyers, I've come to believe that these are all kind of a subcategory of something much broader. 
which is really influence and persuasion. Selling is really just one subcategory, if you look at it that way, of this broader subject. So I do think that even if you came to this webinar specifically to deal with buyers, I would hope that you're going to get some advice uh, that extends just beyond that. So, but you know, selling happens to be a great test case because there's a lot of data out there and you get binary results. They either bought or, or didn't buy. So there's a lot of, you know, clarity from, from using that as, as examples. So here's what I'm going to suggest to you. I have a solution that I'm going to say is 80% effective, meaning if you do it pretty much right, 80% of the time it's going to work for you. I think, you know, in this world, there's very few that approaches 100%. I think, you know, one time out of five, maybe it's not going to work for you. And by the way, 80% assumed you do a pretty good job of it. If you do kind of a half, you know, butted job of it, it's not going to work for you up to 80%. But here's basically the idea. You start out by diffusing emotions. You build collaboration. That allows you to resume a rational dialogue. And the end result is that you enhance your ability to influence and or get the sale. And we'll dive into what that means in particular. It's basically a three-step process I'm about to share with you. And um, with one exception, uh, it's not quite as clear as that would sound. When we say three parts, that's for purposes of explaining. Uh, here's the big lesson. The big lesson of what I'm about to share with you is part one has to come first. That's the one absolute. If you skimp on doing what I'm calling part one, part two and part three are not going to work. You're not going to get that 80% clarity. So let's dive in. Uh, oh, by the way, in addition, uh, before we talk about this, let me suggest that what we're about to talk about today is a blend of art and science. And even though I'm going to use some very specific examples, you know, a lot of people ask me and the rest of us at Trusted Advisory Associates, can you give us some tips and tricks? How do you say it? How do you do it? I'm going to give you very detailed quotations. I'm going to go on in a bit length of how you say it, but the truth is that the precise words that I'm going to give you actually are intended generally. You have to come up with your own words. When you're dealing with trust, there's no particular, uh, almost no phrase or set of magic words that are going to do it for everybody. Everybody's unique. Uh, every two people meeting are unique, and every two people meeting are in a unique situation. So. Although I'm going to give you a lot of detail for suggested words, don't take it literally. You have to come up with your own. So let's dive in. Actually, first, let's define this term irrational when we talk about irrational buyers. Now, let me suggest that irrational buyer's dog probably likes him or her, you know, which uh, let's, let's be careful when we toss that word around. Uh, irrational, I would suggest, you know, ask yourself, is your buyer actually psychotic? That would be one form of irrational. Is your buyer sociopathic? Is your buyer schizophrenic? Is your buyer cognitively impaired? Those, I think, would be valid uses of the term irrational, you know, just cannot talk sense with. I don't think that's usually the case. Oftentimes we say irrational, and I think we'd be better off saying non-rational. It's a different kind of a word. And I think when we use the term non-rational, that allows us to talk much more about emotional issues. So I'm going to suggest selling to an irrational buyer, not the same as selling to a, uh, uh, you know, a, a schizophrenic uh, sociopathic buyer. There just are not that many of them. As I said, their dog probably likes them. And if we reframe things a little bit in that way, hey, they can still be unreasonable. They can still be, you know, biased. They can still be stuck in the past. You know, but, but they're not crazy, I'm using in a non-clinical term. They, like us, run the gamut of human emotions, just to name a few. Fear, sympathy, stress, hope, embarrassment, pride, obsession, elation, desire, uh, empathy. All these things pop up in the daily lives that we all live, inside work, outside work. And I think it's useful to focus on two or three of these in particular, when we talk about dealing with an irrational buyer, more than likely we're going to be dealing with fear, stress, and obsession. Um, as I kind of think about the panoply of emotions, these are the ones that stand out to me, the typical emotions that you're faced with when, when we talk about somebody as, quote, an irrational buyer. So here's our objective of part one. Let's start diving into this three-part model. Part one is to generate consciously shared empathy, and I'll define uh, what I mean by that is we go through it, but it's, it's empathetic, you know, to generate empathy, but that's not enough. If you simply feel empathetic, you have to be sharing it with the other consciously and in dialogue. In other words, the two of you have to be able to objectively speak 
about the empathy that you, that you feel. So how do you approach that? Well, you do it by helping the buyer to articulate their emotions or what they're feeling. So how do you do that? Let's start getting into some very specific language here. Uh, I'm gonna, and these are my words. I am who I am. I'm 69 years old. I grew up in the Midwest. I was educated at an Ivy League college. I have an MBA. All these things are unique to me. Your words are gonna have to vary, but I'll read off my words. So I'm picking up that you're really concerned here about the end client's perception of this decision. Can you, can you say more about that? Or again, my version of it. Just looking at our discussion so far, it sounds like the whole cost issue is a pretty big deal for you. Can you tell me more about what's behind that? Or a third one. It strikes me there's a lot of pressure on you to get this particular outcome. Can you tell me more about where that's coming from? Now, hopefully you get the flavor of that. But remember, this is a blend of art and science and your words are going to have to be different. I'm giving you precise words, but you're going to have to abstract from it and turn it into your words. Now, remember, we're still in part one generating conscious empathy. Now, you'll often have to follow up. One question doesn't do it. So here are a few standard follow-up questions to keep this line of dialogue going. Can you give me another example of that? So if I'm following you, that would mean so-and-so. Is that right? Uh, ouch, I can only imagine that's got to be hard, right? Or yes, I'm beginning to see. Tell me more about that, please. Those are, those are words to keep on going. And, and finally, you get to some point where you're ready to start trying to confirm it with people and you get some confirming language here. Thanks for explaining that. What I'm hearing is the contracting process with all its deadlines and requirements is pretty stressful. Guess what? It's making you stressed. I can appreciate that. If I were in your shoes, I think I'd be pretty stressed too. That's one version. Wow, thanks for taking the time to articulate that. Sounds pretty scary to me too. You're not sure if you got the right resources. You don't know what the final deadline will be. A lot of people are depending on you. I think you'd be nuts not to be at least a little scared. I know I would be. Another one. So if I follow you, this whole project is pretty much consuming all your attention. It's your biggest assignment. All your other assignments are related to it and it's super high visibility. So not surprisingly, it's hard not to be consumed by it. Have I got that right? Again, these are all potential language for you to use. It is blend of art and science. Your words have to be your words for you, for the other person and for the situation. But let's say you get there. How do you know when you're done with this part one of consciously sharing empathy? You'll know it when the client says, all right, you get where I'm coming from. Can we move along? I'd suggest to you anything short of that, you really can't be sure until the client or the buyer is, is willing to say something like that. In other words, when you both talked about your buyer's emotion in straight up rational language, right? Consciously shared empathy. Again, that's what we're, what we're looking for. Now, the risk in step one, which again, as I said, is the critical one, the only hard rule here, you got to finish step one before we go into two and three. And the risk that we all share as professionals is accelerating way too fast to the answer. We're in a hurry to get there. And remember, part one has to come first. And the logic for that is simply basic human dynamics. If we're emotional about something, we tend to get stuck on it. We don't want to proceed past it until it's resolved or at least acknowledged. So that's, that's the logic for part one. Now, before we jump to part two, let me just stop and, and uh, ask if anybody, questions, comments, observations. Uh, uh, you can we, use, we have one ahead. question. I'm trying to get the, um, I'm trying to get a little bit, bit deeper into what the specifics of it are. But the question was, and, and uh, it looks like Andy, if he, okay. Uh, um, so the question is, I'm just trying to get it. Uh, do you mean the relationship with the salesperson, company, can you elaborate? I mean yeah, the person. Uh, it says, what about the person who focuses strictly on past relationships, not merit? And I'm not sure if we're talking about the salesperson or the company. Uh, what about an irrational way who focuses strictly on past relationships and not merit? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I know. Andy, can you come off mute and, and speak to that? I'm not sure. We can come back to that one. All right. Uh, to clarify, um, uh, Jason, I think you were talking about the, um, whether we're talking about the person or the company, all of what I'm talking about is person to person. One of the important points that we at Trusted Advisor Associates try to talk about is that the strongest form of trust is personal. 
institutional trust, brand trust, company trust is kind of a, a weaker reflection. Yes, we say, I trust Amazon, I trust FedEx, but to do what? Not very big deals. I trust you know, FedEx to deliver packages. I don't trust the FedEx guy to babysit my granddaughter. Uh, different kind of strength. Uh, Carolina says, part one looks easy. <laughs> Let the client get out of it, their system, right? And then they can focus. It is, it is simple. You're absolutely right. It's not easy. It looks easy, but uh, you know, we all get wrapped up in these things. You're dealing with somebody that you've already been stressed enough to, uh, you know, to label as irrational. Uh, they probably got bad feelings. It's really hard to get out of it, but in principle, you're right. It's simple. You need to get past the emotion thing before you can proceed to, uh, to all the other stuff. Kevin says, get to the heart of the emotions they're feeling and empathize with their situation. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's it. Uh, I'm going to invite Stuart Hirsch in particular. Stuart, if you want to come off mute and comment on any of this, you're kind of uniquely situated to do so. Want to say anything? All right. Stuart does stuck. it. Tracy, can you take him off mute or do we have to do that? Um, uh, oh. might be stuck yeah, I tried to unmute. There we go. Can there you we hear me? go. Yes. Yeah, the more, as, as I'm listening to this, I know we're talking about this in terms of of sales. First of all, I agree with everything you've said. I think this applies to any situation, um, including dealing with, uh, um, if, if you change that to deal with an irrational boss, an irrational CEO, an irrational anybody. So I just want to add that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, sales, again, is a subcategory of a broader emotional interaction between people that arises in, you know, trying to persuade people of a point of view, trying to get your advice taken, um, lots of situations. This is just a subcomponent. So thanks for articulating that. All right, let's move on to part two. I'm going to call this framing. The objective here is to link the emotions to the particular arguments that you've been having. So if we go back to you know uh, stressing about schedules, for example, here's where you want to where you want to connect the stress and the schedules, and it looks something like this. Um, now this is in theory, right? We can make a list of uh, here's all the possible unreasonable irrational topics listed down the left. These are from the the list of seven or eight that I gave at the beginning, and across the top here you see the three key emotions that I mentioned. Now. Life is never this clear, okay? It's just, um, I don't mean to claim that there's, you can or should get total clarity. What you really want to do, though, is to be clear, what are we arguing about and what's the emotion behind it? And in this step two, we want to start by linking them up. So how do we say that? What's some language? Well, let me give you a few language. So I'm wondering if one of the biggest drivers of this stress that you're describing is the whole issue of time frame. Uh, does a lot of the stress boil down to this time issue? Notice I've underscored stress, which is the emotion, and time frame, which is the presenting issue. Uh, another one, for example. So at the risk of dwelling a bit more on what you're afraid of that might go wrong, I'm sensing that since this project is largely outside your primary of expertise, you might be afraid you might not grasp some of the most important aspects. Is that roughly right? That your fears center a lot around having to rely on others for expertise? So here we're linking fears one of those key emotions with expertise, the presenting problem. A third opportunity or a third example. Given what I hear you saying about the all-consuming nature of this project, I'm wondering if that has something to do with your particular concerns about the market research aspect. Does the market research component present a particular focal point or trigger or symbol of the whole all-consuming nature of this project? Again, we're linking here, you know, the, the um, uh, obsessive uh, emotion with the particular component that seems to be the heart of the uh, or the presenting issue. Again, art and science, your words have to be unique to you. I cannot come up with, nobody can come up with specific language that will cover every situation. When you're dealing with interpersonal relationships, I think that's almost inevitable. There's no magic bullet phrases that work all the time. You need to kind of absorb the intent here. So how do you know when you're done with part two? I think when the client says, yeah, pretty much it does come down to that. Yes, that's mainly what's bothering me. You're right. And you'll notice that the, the emotional tone of the way I just said that, they're getting to some kind of resolution. They're getting to accept, yes, this is kind of the connective part of what I'm angry about. And that's a big lot of progress. In other words, when you have both said out loud the trigger for the buyer's emotions, that's when you know you're done with part two. 
part two, by the way, usually doesn't take that long. Uh, the, the real trick is if you do a great job of part one and you end up with the client saying, yeah, you get where I'm coming from, that's where most of the work is. This one can often go fairly quickly. So let's go to part three, what I call envisioning. And this is a little bit unusual, but the purpose of this is to re-anchor new emotions to future outcomes. How do you do it? You envision an alternative to be state of affairs. And uh, here's some words, this one, I'm gonna use a lot of words on this one. So we've been talking about the huge stress that's placed on you and that you're feeling around this issue of time frame. We absolutely need to talk about solutions to the time frame issue. I get it, and we'll do that shortly. But first, I want to ask you one more big question. Assuming that we solve the time frame issue, assuming we come up with a solution that's viable, that works for us, and more importantly, works for you, just assuming that for the moment, what would that do to your stress levels? What would that mean for you? What would happen if your stress levels about time frame went away? What would you do differently? What would, how would your daily life change? And what would it mean to be free of that kind of stress? Now, even when you put things that way, many buyers are gonna push back and say, well, blah, 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 I wanna know what you're gonna do about it. That's what would fix my stress levels. So if you get pushback, I think you need to be forthright and push back on this. Yes, 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 I get it, we will get to that. I'm still asking you to take a couple of minutes uninfluenced by any particular solution and tell me about the impact of getting this issue solved. What's at stake? What would change? How would things be different? I want to get at the value of solving this issue before we dive into specifics, so humor me, please. Now, or another, what would change if we can dissipate the stress of this time frame issue? I promise we'll get into solutions directly thereafter. In other words, don't apologize. Say forthrightly, this is important. Now, this bit about envisioning is doing a couple things. Let me, let me mention uh, an, an analogy from the world of ballroom dancing. Um, we're going to go way far afield here, okay? Um, it, that particular business has a very interesting part of their sales process. It tends to be kind of a manip manipulative process in many ways. I'm not trying to recommend it. But there's one thing I do extremely well that the people are taught to who teach ballroom dance lessons. At the beginning of the lesson, they always start out by saying, now remember, you've bought the social program here at our studio. And the objective of the social program is to make you comfortable getting up on the floor and dancing at a wedding and to feel good about that. Now, today, we're going to dive into tango, step two, focusing on balance. And then you do the lesson. And then at the end of the lesson, with one minute left, they say, well, now, today, we focused on tango, balance, step two. And remember, all of this is in service to the broader goal of the social program of getting you comfortable up in front of a, a in a wedding with people looking at you and you feeling great about it. So they start off at kind of a high level, the beginning of the lesson. What's the goal? To make you feel good dancing in public in front of other people at a wedding. Then you get into the detail of the lesson itself. And then you go back again and you re-articulate the goal. Why are we doing this? So that you can get up in front of other human beings at a wedding and feel good about what you're doing. So they're always anchoring. That's a really good recommendation for us to think about in this third section. You know, uh, How do you know when you're done? this one. Well, that's when the client says, yeah, that really would be great. I, okay, I do want to get there. And this stuff has been getting in the way. So let's, let's figure it out. In other words, when the buyer really comes to see this contentious issue as a barrier to their greater success. Now, um, uh, there, this begs one obvious question, you know, the next, uh, the next stuff, what do you do? I'm going to suggest that the next step implicit is not that big a deal. You know, the solution. Uh, I'm going to go back and suggest if you do steps one, two, and three, 80% of the time, this step four, the actual solution stuff, is like a piece of cake. It falls off uh, just very easily. I'll give you some general advice how to do it, but I want to underscore most of the work is done in steps one, two, and three, and our biggest concern is rushing through to get to four. If you rush through to get to four, you lower the odds considerably. So however you choose to approach what you used to think of the solution, 80% of the time you've now gotten rid of the emotion and the angst and the irrational component of your buyer. Nonetheless, let's, um, uh, I'll give you a little bit of language for step four too. The methods matter less than continually harking back to the shared experience that you've created. You've acknowledged the buyer's feelings, you've jointly created a problem statement, you've jointly committed to a desirable to be state and that you know, that said, here are a couple tips for rolling, for finishing it up. Uh, one always reliable tool is break it down. 
you know, identify some secondary issues that affect the primary uh, or break down the component issues of, of the primary issue. Another one is to always assume collaboration and keep going on it. Proactively offer some steps you can take on your side and then request some steps that the buyer can take on their side. And again, if you've done steps one, two, and three, that conversation is going to happen collaboratively. The solutions are really that difficult. What's difficult is getting people to agree jointly collaboratively on them. So quick overview of what we said here. It's a three-step process. Number one is consciously shared empathy. Number two is linking emotions to the arguments that you've been having. And number three is re-anchoring new emotions like collaboration, you know, excitement for the 2B state to a solution. And then what I called step four, didn't even put on here in detail, is actually working out the details. So what does all this mean? You've all heard the phrase, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. It's a truism, but it's no less true for being a truism. There is this sequential point. If you don't do number one, making sure that people know that you care, that's that consciously shared empathy, the rest just doesn't happen. It's degraded. People don't want to continue. They drag their feet. They may nod their head, but their, their head's not in the game. Um, emotion is what stands between you and problem resolution. You can't go around it. You can't beat it down. You got to go through it. And if you do that, I would suggest uh, you're going to get that 80% probable solution. So my, my takeaway is your rational client is probably, or maybe even disturbingly, not much crazier than you are. Uh, let me stop there, and uh, I didn't want to take too much more time than the uh, 30 minutes or so we've done here. And let's just open this up to some discussion. Uh, comments, critiques, questions, uh, let's open it up here. And you can use either go off mute. I think everybody can do well, that. It's actually probably easiest to stay in the chat because I think okay. we're going to talk All right. But, stay uh, on chat then. There's some conversations going back and forth about um, not necessarily direct questions, um, but there's – some conversations about, you know, trying to address the problem up front and how easy or hard that, that, that difficult that is. Uh, but if anyone has questions, I'd please ask them directly into the conversation box. Um, well, I see a couple here. Uh, this, Charlie, this is all good, but what if the buyer is keeping something from you, if they have a secret agenda, something that he or she cannot admit? I think uh, two points on that. Number one, you can't force somebody to do anything. You can't force them, including give up a secret. On the other hand, you can greatly increase the odds that they will share a secret with you if you go through this step of empathy, trying to help people uh, you know, understand their feelings and let them know that you understand their feelings. That kind of process is very conducive to people saying, you know what, I'm, now that we're talking about this, let me let you in on something that's been going on you're much more likely to get them to reveal that secret if you follow all the stuff about consciously shared empathy than if you don't. Is that a guarantee? No. That's why I said up front, 80% of the time, this is a probabilistic estimate. That's all you can hope for in this life is, is good probabilities. So we have two other points. Uh, Kathy writes in, and this is just more of a statement, that neuroscience is showing that people often make decisions based on emotions, and then they justify <laughs> them with rational words. So the model supports finding emotional trigger, which is an interesting point. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kathy. I, I think that's, of course, that's absolutely right. We are seeing that. And uh, even even pre, you know, the, the sort of uh, popularity of neuroscience in the last decade or so, I remember people articulating that we, we make up our minds with our heart and we then rationalize them with our brain. Another way of saying we, we make a decision and then we, we seek to constantly justify it in terms of more socially acceptable data points. So I think that's you know very right. And on some level, we, we knew that before neuroscience. Neuroscience just put the cherry on top of it. It's nice to know. Um, I, I just I just launched a quick poll. Of, you know, we, we obviously try to gauge feedback on, on if this is valuable for people's time. But another question popped up um, from uh, DS. Houston Jackson, they, um, most of the time people don't even know their real problems, otherwise it's generally resolved. How do you switch <laughs> towards the real root cause? It sounds like you're, you know, obviously a little bit of therapy in there, but. Um, no, that's a great comment. I, uh, people don't know the real problems. My, my co-author on the trusted advisor, David Maester, <clears throat> used to have a saying that I, I always thought was a little hyperbolic, but I've come to believe he was exactly right. And here's what he said. 
He said, the problem is never what the client said it was in the first meeting. Problem is never what the client said it was in the first meeting. And like I said, I, I used to think it was hyperbolic. I now think he's really onto something. The truth is people seek out, seek out you know, sellers or consultants or advisors, uh, rarely do they search them out because they absolutely know the question and need an answer. That kind of stuff you can get by point and click on the web once you've defined it. What people are really looking for is a little more certainty, a little more security, a little help framing the problem. I bet everybody on this call who's dealt with clients, you've had a moment in your interactions where the conversation is going along and, and at some point and the client says, that's it right there. What, what you just said, you put your finger on it. That's the problem. That's what's hanging us up. Yes, that's what we need to fix. That's the moment, I would argue, that you made the sale. That's the moment that the client bought in to your point of view. That's the moment that, you know, the magic happens. And that comes from collaborative discussions. It really doesn't become because you're so much smarter than they are. It doesn't come from compiling data and figuring out. It comes from, you know, people batting it back and forth and kind of generating cumulative insights. And the way you get there is by easing the conversation between two people. So they become more comfortable with you, more willing to share, and you become likewise. So, um, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, Stuart had a great point that these, this, this process takes time. But, you know, it, it doesn't happen immediately. Uh, sometimes it doesn't even happen in the same conversation. So. <clears throat> well, that's true. But Stuart, and I think you'd agree with this, the, um, uh, we overestimate how much time it takes. One of, the, one of the common trust myths that we hear all the time, trust takes time. Yeah, mostly not. What it really takes is courage. What it really takes is our ability to find the words in the moment to express or to get to that secret or to encourage the other person to feel heard. Um, just hanging out with people for years does not necessarily generate trust. Now, there are some exceptions. Yes, there's a positive correlation between how much time you have and how much trust there is. And yes, if you look at something like reliability, which does require the passage of time to create a, a, a track record, but all the other aspects of trust really don't take that much time. Um, uh, but, I mean, that, I'm going to take Stuart. I think I can take him off of mute if yeah. you want to jump in. He said he's saying I'm, I was incorrect. There we go. <laughs> uh, he's saying it's not take time. He doesn't saying he's saying it could take more than one conversation. But let me yeah, see. Yeah, certainly uh, true. Right. Yeah, the question is whether it takes more than the, the thought here is that sometimes it takes more than one conversation, and you could be in one conversation has to end abruptly. Things happen. And the question then becomes, how do you get back into the conversation you were having? And it's really a point about, um, you know, hammering home again the emotional place that people have moved to. And sometimes you have to put people back into that state of mind that they were in yeah. at the time, that they, made the, that they made whatever emotional commitment they did to, uh, to move to the next step. And you might have to remind them about the conversation, when it happened, where it happened, if you were having something to eat, what they were having. Uh, whatever yeah. it is, just so they can be back in that mental state if it happens over more than one conversation. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think these take a lot of time, but I do think that there are times when you don't get to finish a conversation that you wanted to fit complete. Yeah, well said. Completely agree. Thank you, Stuart. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other comments here? I think, uh, well, Charlie, do you want to go to the next slide? It's got contact information. If anybody has any questions, we are yes. going to be sent we are going to be sending out um, a full recorded copy of the webinar, a PDF of the webinar. Uh, if, you have any, if you need to reach Charlie, his contact information will be in the email. Um, and, you, you know, we can find our next webinars at trustedadvisor.com backslash webinars. And there's plenty of content uh, around all, all this type of material and how to, how to work with clients and understand their emotional behaviors. Um, Charlie, anything else you want to add? No, I wanna, we're going to return people to their daily lives, however they may be, um, after a quick 34 minutes here. Thanks, everybody, for so, coming. Uh, somebody's actually asking what the title of the book is, and it's just called The Trusted Advisor. Um, That's correct. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, it's a, one of the best-selling business books in, in, related to these topics, so it's very easy to uh, find. Right. The Trusted Advisor. That's correct. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out today. Have a great day. Take care.